Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. It's the third time I've been to Frascati, and I've been to uh, Italy many, many times. Um, and I wanted to just start, before I start my talk, I just wanted to give you a little sense of where I come from. Um, uh, we come from Western Australia, and, uh, uh, which has been in the news lately because, it is the, because Perth has been the centre of the search for the lost aircraft, uh, the MH370. But um, uh, uh, some years ago, we, um, uh, we set up uh, uh, this centre called the Australian International Gravitational Research Centre, which is in a place in the uh, empty land about 80 kilometres from Perth. And uh, it is a site where we want to build a gravitational wave detector like the Virgo detector at Kashina, which is a wonderful uh, piece of technology um, that uh, I've just been visiting. Um, and in this picture, there's one thing which is not real, and that is our dream, which is to build this big, big detector. That is not real. But everything else here is real, and I want to show you the connection with Italy. Because uh, in our collaborations with Italy, we've, uh, um, I had been to um, Pisa many times, and we had a plan that while we built a research centre, which is this part, we would also build an education centre. And this is the education centre. And we were inspired by our colleagues in uh, um, Pisa. And we decided that anywhere where you do gravitational research, you must have a leaning tower. <laughs> and so we built a tower, which is uh, called the Leaning Tower of Jinjin. And this is used to inspire young people with the story of Galileo. They go to this tower. At the bottom of the tower, there is a water tap. And you can uh, take a balloon and fill it with water, carry it to the top of the tower, and then drop the balloon. And, you can, and at the bottom, there is a sandy area. And you make beautiful craters. And next door, we have an astronomy center. And then you can go and look at the craters on the moon and see that they look just like the crater that you made with the tower. But we also have um, a large gallery where we, do, uh, 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 where we try to teach Einsteinian physics, which is really the topic of my talk today. And because this is modelled on the Piazza de Miracoli in Pisa, of course we had to have a baptistry as well. And this is the baptistry. This is the largest um, buckyball in the world. And uh, it is on top of a uh, tall wall, so it is a 20-meter dome. And there we have exhibition about the history of the universe. So, uh, uh, so if ever you come to Perth, please come and see the center. 20,000 people a year come to the center, and uh, ma mainly students. And uh, uh, I think you will enjoy it. Ah, oh, what is happening here? Um, but now just to finish giving you a context, I'm just going to escape from this for a second and come to... Oh, I've lost my glasses. I want to sh uh, I have a... A little bit of video I'd like to play you which gives you a little bit more of a sense of this place. It is in a big empty plane. One hour's drive north of central Perth, an extraordinary complex of facilities is located in the middle of a large tract of pristine Banksy woodland. The Jin Jin Gravity Precinct was set as part of a nationwide collaboration to support Australia's participation in the international search for Einstein's elusive gravitational waves that travel through space at the speed of light. Researchers hope to use these waves 
to make direct observations of black holes and the birth of the universe. So I'm not going to play any more of that because it is taking time from my uh, presentation today. But uh, um, So, to start my talk, I want to talk to you about the research that we've been doing to try to change the paradigm by which we teach science to young people. And we call this Einstein first. We don't teach Euclidean geometry first, we teach them first the geometry of curved space. Um, this is a collaboration uh, between a whole lot of people and it's called the Science Education Enrichment Project. Um, we have several PhD students working in this area and uh, I'll uh, try to uh, give you a sense of what we've done and how well it works and how it is something that is really possible to do. But I want to first uh, give some introduction to it. I called it uh, teaching physics in the LIGO-Virgo era because this is the era in which we are going to be observing curved space. Already astronomers observe curved space regularly. It's the era of gravitational wave detection and it's the era when Newtonian physics is going to be really obsolete as a fundamental way of understanding the universe. Um, so uh, here, of course, is the Virgo detector in Akashina. Uh, we were there um, last week and we actually climbed to the top of one of these mountains here to look down over this beautiful, huge instrument across the plain. So, what I want to talk about is the, first of all, the 25 centuries of discovery about um, space, time, matter and radiation. And I want to go on to talk about why it's important that we should be teaching our youngest children our best understanding of the universe and not some obsolete fiction. Um, I'm going to show you some trial results from children aged 11 and upwards up to teachers to show that this is something which is possible. I'm going to talk about why people think it is impossible. And um, I want to show you how we can make it fun and interesting. And I have a few uh, little videos to show you that the deep concepts can be taught in a very simple, easy way. Any teacher can do it. Um, so we call this all Einsteinian physics, mainly because we need to have a nice label to explain what we are doing. And by Einsteinian physics, we mean curved space, warp time, the idea of photons, and the idea of quantum uncertainty. So all these are uh, ideas that we want to be teaching to very young people. Let's start with the history which goes back to Euclid. Um, of course, it goes far beyond Euclid. It actually, the history goes another um, one and a half thousand years beyond Euclid when geometry was starting to be understood. But Euclid's book is interesting because it is the book that has been used to teach science for the last 2,000 or more years. It's the most influential science book of all time. It has been published in a thousand editions and it's taught in every school. It's either taught, uh, I was taught by the actual book elements and I'm sure there are some people in this room who studied from that book but I know that the modern textbooks have taken the content of it and put it into other books. Um, so that is the first that people learn about geometry. And, uh, but people have been trying to understand the, um, the geometry of space. I think the quest to understand the idea of space has been a part of our culture for thousands of years. And one of the approaches to it 
relates to the number pi, which of course is the ratio between the circumference and the diameter of a circle. Uh, calculating pi uses Euclid, Euclid's geometry. One of the, 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 uh, the, the traditional way of estimating the value of pi is to draw a polygon inside and a polygon outside a circle, and the value of pi is determined by the circumference, uh, the, the difference between these two circumferences. This was a method that was developed thousands of years ago, but the geometry is a geometry of flat space like paper, and all calculations of pi assume that space is flat. The digits in pi represent a theoretical precision of flatness. Um, and we all know um, and, uh, that the sum of the angles of, tri of a triangle in Euclidean space is 180 degrees. Uh, in Euclidean space, any circle you draw satisfies that requirement of uh, circumference to diameter. So in other words, any circle has, uh, will, if you do a measurement, it will give you a result that is exactly in agreement with the, uh, uh, with the value of pi. And today, pi is known to more than 10 to the 12 decimal places. And there are some individuals in the world, there's one person in China who knows the di digits of pi to 40,000 decimal places. An extraordinary thing to do. Um, so pi is universal in Euclidean space. But if space is different, from the, um, is different from Euclidean space, then the experimental value will differ from the calculated value. Well, let, let's just look at this in history. And the, it's interesting that it crosses all cultures. Uh, one of the uh, world records was made by this man, uh, uh, Zhu Zhongjie, in China, 480 AD. He determined the value of pi to be equal to this number, 355 over 113, or 3.1415929, nearly the right number, just a small error, 8 times 10 to the minus 8. And that record held for a long time. Others were still uh, making similar parallel calculations at, at the time. But in uh, um, the Arabian world, or the Muslim world, Jamshid al-Kashi in 1400 AD computed pi to 17 decimal places. Got this value for pi, enough to easily compare it with the modern experimental values. Well, all of that is just a little bit of the way that our culture has focused on Euclidean geometry. The first person to question anything about Euclidean geometry was Gauss, Carl Gauss, who's famous in electromagnetism, but is not so famous for questions about space. But he said, why should we believe this 2,300-year-old geometry of Euclid? He was the first person to question whether that geometry was a valid description of the universe. And he built a beautiful instrument to try to test it. Um, he published a theorem which says the shape of space can be determined by measuring angles and distances. Here in Frascati is the Nautilus gravitational wave detector that was trying to measure ripples in the, and is still operating, I saw it just a few, uh, an hour ago, that uh, is trying to measure changes in the shape of space which are gravitational waves, um, are by measuring distances, by, by measuring the length of a metal bar. 
and the Virgo detector is doing exactly the same thing by measuring distances between distant mirrors and using lasers to measure those distances. So uh, Gauss had it all worked out. He built this instrument and he did this experiment with the instrument. He had three people. This is a telescope combined with a mirror to reflect sunlight. And what he tried to do was to measure the sum of the angles of a triangle between three mountains in Bavaria. He, if he had been right in his questioning and sufficiently precise in his experiment, he would have found that the sum of the angles was not 180 degrees. But at that stage, that was, it was just a question. In fact, his precision wasn't good enough and he didn't uh, observe anything. But his student was Riemann, who developed the mathematics of curved space geometry and laid the mathematical foundation for Einstein to come up with his theory of general relativity. And his theory, uh, in, uh, and all of this Einsteinian revolution, involves thinking about space and time as a unified structure, space-time, that uh, space-time is elastic, it has energy, it, has, it is not just, uh, um, just a, a, a sort of a conceptual framework, but it is something real that contains energy. The shape of space-time is determined by matter. He also showed that light comes as streams of photons. And he showed that falling objects follow their shortest path in space-time. So that, that's just a summary. And as most of you know, uh, it was very soon after he published his theory that the deflection of starlight past the sun was observed. And uh, the new, this is the famous uh, story from the New York Times, front page, 1919, where the deflection of stars near the sun was first observed as the first observation, experimental observation, that the space around the sun was curved. What's interesting here is that, first of all, this would imply that the experimental value of pi near the sun is wrong at the sixth significant figure. So that number that you calculate is different from the real number that would apply experimentally in the universe at the sixth significant figure. But there's something else in this story which is very interesting. And this relates to the main topic of my talk today, which is uh, why we haven't taught any of this to our young people in schools, why it is not part of the school science curriculum. And it's this statement that was put in the bottom of this front page headline. No more in all the world could comprehend it, said Einstein. He was already saying that this is too complicated for anybody to understand. I am a genius. I can understand it. Other people cannot. And that story was perpetuated. Some of you might have heard the story of Sir Arthur Eddington soon after he made the measurements of the deflection of starlight. And uh, the journalist said to Sir Arthur, is it true that only three people in the world understand Einstein's um, theory? And Eddington's reply, some of you might know it, was this. Who is the third <laughs> so there was this idea that this was elite knowledge for just a few people. And another person, uh, one of the brilliant physicists of the 20th century, uh, Richard Feynman, had words to say about the people who inherited Einstein's theory, who worked on Einstein's theory, uh, developing the mathematics, uh, trying to understand it in detail. And he said, 
People who work in gravitational theory believe that the equations are more difficult than in any other field, and from my viewpoint, this is false. If you look at the equations used by uh, 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 physicists uh, who study the mechanics of uh, Newtonian mechanics of orbits or of strains in structures, you can find just as complex mathematics. You can make Newtonian physics as mathematically complicated as you want. And Einsteinian physics is the same. But you can also simplify both of them. And that's, the important, that's what's important here. Well, one of the great uh, uh, heroes of this field is John Wheeler. He had a really good way of finding nice words to describe uh, um, some of the physics that comes out of Einstein's theory. He was the person who invented the word black hole in 1967. He captured the essence of Einsteinian physics. Um, today, uh, we, uh, astronomers believe that in our galaxy, there are 20,000 black holes swarming around the central black hole, which has got a mass of about 4 million solar masses. And uh, so our galaxy has got Newtonian, uh, Einsteinian physics uh, you know, r right at its core. Um, it's, par it's part of uh, the universe as we see it today. Uh, the, if this is going to work. Uh, so we see things, this is a simulation, but we see things very much like this in the universe with the Hubble Space Telescope and things like that. Uh, this is a black hole, a simulation of a black hole passing across the Andromeda uh, galaxy. Um, but other images, like one I'll show you in a moment, is something that you can just, uh, is a, a photograph from the Hubble Space Telescope that for one click on Google, you can find that image. It's accessible to all of us, real images of this type of thing. <coughs> The other thing that Wheeler did was to introduce a way of expressing Einstein's theory of relativity in a very simple phrase that I think all children could learn and could understand at the, a very early age. Matter tells space how to curve, space tells matter how to move. And out of that comes the idea that gravity is not a force emanating out of planets, some sort of force coming out of the ground, but it is um, the force you have to apply to stop things from following a gradient in time. Now that's a strange idea, but it's not so strange when you uh, relate it to uh, uh, real experiments that are done with clocks, for example. Um, and of course, comes out of Einstein's theory, the idea that if space is elastic, it can sustain waves, and so there will be waves passing through us, through everything, and those waves change the shape of everything. So, so the shapes of objects are being changed by gravitational waves. Uh, this gives us the new way of exploring the universe. It gives us new technologies, which um, some of us here are, are working on, um, what we are doing is inventing gravity radios that can allow us to listen to black holes to experience some of this Einsteinian universe that um, can be otherwise rather difficult uh, to observe. In 1993, the Nobel Prize was uh, given for the proof of existence of gravitational waves uh, be, uh, because t a pair of neutron stars was seen to be spiralling together closer and closer, getting faster and faster, according to this curve. And uh, uh, th the theory in the experiment agrees perfectly, and that tells us that gravitational waves exist, that energy is being lost by systems like that. Here's 
uh, <coughs> a picture of the sort of system that um, Hulse and Taylor discovered. The two, two stars spiralling together and you can see space in the background rippling with gravitational waves. And uh, I thought there was one, one more here. Anyway, let's, that's an... Uh, so, <clears throat> the next, uh, the ne the next uh, vivid demonstration of uh, the reality of these ideas uh, is the one from NASA's uh, spacecraft that was called Gravity Probe B. Gravity Probe B measured uh, the shape of space around the Earth, observed that its shape was rather like this. Uh, the experiment uh, can be uh, uh, ex uh, interpreted as a measurement of the ratio of the circumference of the orbit of this spacecraft compared with the diameter of the orbit. And the discrepancy here is... Uh, 28 millimetres. So if you use the, new, the uh, Euclidean formula for the perimeter of a circle, circumference of a circle, you will find that for this circle it is wrong at the level of 28 millimetres. Now it's not a lot wrong, but it is wrong. And it means that the formula that you, that you if you were a teacher, were teaching at school, it would be most important that you could say this is an approximation. It is, does not fully describe space. And uh, here are these some of the, another one of these gravitational wave detectors, as I said, searching for these ripples in space. So let's now just have a look at what we teach in schools today and compare it with the real world. In school, we teach Euclidean geometry, but as I've emphasised, the geometry of the real world is curved space geometry. We teach that space and time are absolute. Maybe not by saying it is absolute, but by implying that space and time are absolute. And in reality, space and time are relative and they're uh, um, unified into space-time. We teach that light is a wave and that electrons are particles, but in reality we have a wave-particle duality. We teach that energy is massless when in reality E equals mc squared. We teach a sort of Newtonian determinism when in reality there's quantum uncertainty. And we teach that gravity is a mysterious force described by Newton, but uh, it is always made out to be uh, uh, mysterious, whereas in reality, gravity is a simple manifestation of curved space-time. So, my question is, is it necessary to teach students all the old science before we teach them the truth? The next question, can we increase the motivation and interest in science by teaching modern ideas up front instead of postponing it to some future time when they have learnt all the old stuff? And is it too difficult? Now, most people will probably agree with this and they'll agree with this, but mostly they'll say, oh, but it's too difficult. We can't do it. It's too hard. So the most important point of my talk uh, is to try to show you that it is not too hard, that it can, it can easily be done. Um, I told you that curved space is one click away on Google. Here is, if you put in gravitational lensing into Google images, then this is one of the first images you will find. And this is an image of a galaxy completely distorted by the gravitational effects of a foreground galaxy. This galaxy is 
has been distorted into a ring. Its real shape is not like that at all. So, uh, <coughs> so we keep the beautiful ideas for an academic elite. We don't bring them to the ordinary people. And I believe that the fact that we do that is linked to the plummeting enrolments in science, the, the, the loss of interest in science. Um, why are we doing it? And the answer is that teachers have not been taught the truth, and the reason for that is that people think it's too difficult. And I think that all students get the feel that they're being taught old science instead of learning the new science. Um, and the main problem is that we teach Euclidean geometry as if, as if it was an exact description of the world. We, of course, have to teach that this is a very useful approximation, but it is not an exact description. It is a beautiful and elegant invention, but it's an invention of the mind. Um, so those are what my concerns are. Well, I've given many, many public lectures about gravitational waves. And every time I've given a public lecture over 30 years, always trying to find better and simpler ways of explaining things, I have somebody coming up to me saying, wow, you must be a genius to understand that. It's all so complicated. I'm so confused. And uh, some time ago, I was doing a, a special program for, um, uh, for gifted students, for very talented students from uh, the top schools in Australia. And they had all come to our centre and I was and this was their first exposure to the ideas of general relativity. But I took my 11-year-old son with me. He was 11 at the time. And on the way, I started telling him, uh, I asked him if he would be my assistant because I wanted to do some demonstrations and things. And he started asking me questions and I realised that he could understand some of the things that I was talking about. And uh, he's not a particularly gifted student or anything. He... he uh, he probably th really thinks these ideas are a bit boring. But, um, um, but he sh showed me that he could understand it. And I said, would you like me to come into your classroom and I'll tell all the class about these things? And, this was the, and so that was the first uh, chance where I had the opportunity to see if it was possible to teach to very young children some of those ideas. And I then went into the school uh, with 11-year-olds and uh, we tested the uh, children with questionnaires and things before and afterwards to find out what their understandings were. But we also asked them questions like, do you think you are too young to understand these things? And universally they said, we're not too young to understand. And then I started to understand what is actually happening with these uh, young people. Um, they had completely open minds. They were not astonished by any of it. It was just new and interesting things, but it was, they were not astonished. And the reason that people are astonished by it is because it's contradicting their preconceived views. Um, I think that young people at that age are still learning the language of reality just like they're learning their own language and maybe learning, like many, so many Italians, becoming very good at foreign languages, um, they are learning the languages of the language of reality. We all learn a language of reality, a language to describe the universe. And um, as Einstein said, common sense is the collection of uh, prejudices acquired by age 18. So we create a set of prejudices about Euclidean geometry with young people and then after that, at the age of 20 or something, when they come to university, we start to teach them what is our more modern idea. Um, <clears throat> 
So if an idea can capture a child for a lifetime, what's clear is that the Euclidean idea has captured the world for millennia. And Aristotle's doctrine of um, free fall captured the Western world for something like 2,000 years until it was overthrown by Galileo. So those are examples of people having these preconceived views and being uh, um, uh, captured by those ideas. So if we're going to make the language of space and time, the language that we, that we know is the best description of the universe available as part of our culture, we've got to take, tell it to children when they are young, when they're forming their common sense view of the world. So that is what we are arguing. Uh, I, uh, the one part of uh, Einstein's physics that most people, if you ask somebody in the street, what do you know about Einstein's physics? Some people would say E equals MC squared. Uh, many people wouldn't really know what E equals MC squared means, but they will have at least heard of it. But they don't know that E equals e MC squared means, for example, that the sun gives out four million tonnes of energy every second, uh, that each of us uses about a milligram of energy in a year, that your mobile phone is a little bit heavier when it's fully charged. Um, those ideas we tested with young people, and again, for them, it seems quite easy and straightforward. It's not something surprising. So our science education enrichment project was trying to find out experimentally with classes of different ages how, uh, what was the appropriate way to change the curriculum. Uh, what we did was uh, develop curriculum material, um, develop all sorts of classroom activity-based learning. I want to show you some examples of it in a second. We've also run professional development programs for teachers to uh, to try to upgrade the knowledge of teachers to the point that they could feel confident to teach young people the Einsteinian physics. And we're, de we're developing a teacher's handbook and video material, and uh, that's still progressing. <clears throat> In asking uh, the children uh, um, about the work um, that we've been doing, as I already said, uh, they say they're not too young to understand, and when we've tested them, they've shown excellent performance in their conceptual understanding. We've tested with 16-year-olds, and they say it would have been good to have learnt these, these ideas earlier. 95% um, of the students we've asked reject the necessity of learning Newtonian physics before they learn the Einsteinian ideas. And one of the most interesting things that we discovered was uh, at the end of um, programs that we've done, we've asked what was the most interesting thing that you learnt and what was the most difficult thing that you learnt. And we found a very strong correlation between the things they found most interesting with the things they found most difficult. That says that children want to be challenged. You don't want to always be making everything much easier. You want to be challenging them. And, uh, and the sort of ideas that they, uh, they chose specifically as the ones they found most interesting was the idea that gravity is an effect of warp time, the principle of maximal ageing that says that everything ages at the fastest possible rate unless you apply a force to it, which is a direct outcome of general relativity, um, and the idea of single photon interference, that how is it that you can have interference happening when there's only one photon present, which is uh, one of the central parts of quantum mechanics. Um, with the teachers, uh, what we've tried to do is to find out how difficult it is for them to learn 
and because many of the teachers that we have been working with are teachers who have been not trained in physics at all. Uh, they, uh, some of them might have been sports teachers who were asked to teach physics. Uh, sometimes they're primary school uh, teachers who, who have no special training in physics at all. And uh, we want to find out how difficult it was for them. And we want to get uh, also to get their advice as to how we should get this into the curriculum. The hardest thing of all is to change the national curriculum because the inertia involved in that process is terrible. And I have to say, we haven't solved that problem yet. Um, <clears throat> but when we did testing, 35% um, of, the, of the teachers scored less than 50% in a pretest designed to find out what they knew. Mean score about 52%. Uh, after a one day uh, intensive program, 70%, 95% um, of them scored more than 70%, and the mean score was 81. We could see that in the testing, student, uh, the teachers could really improve and develop a level of confidence. Sort of questions that we were asking were questions like this. What is gravity? What is light? Uh, in geometry, can parallel lines ever meet? Um, here's an interesting uh, answer given in a pretest. Light is responsible for the visibility of things. Light removes darkness. You can find statements of that sort in uh, Euclid's um, book um, Optica, uh, published 2,300 years ago. Um, in the post-test, they, they know that light is an electromagnetic radiation with wave and particle properties. And the teachers all agree that it's feasible to do this, there, of course, I have to say that the teachers we have, uh, that we have tested, have to some extent been self-selected. So you have to be a little bit sceptical about the numbers that we have here because this is just the groups that we've been able to access and that doesn't necessarily represent all teachers. But, um, but we found that the teachers are very positive about it happy to introduce the, um, the programs, but they also realise that it is important that they get some training. Um, so how is it we've done this? How have we made it work? And probably a lot of you will be most interested in, in what are the methods we've used to get these ideas across. And the most important one, I think, is the use of analogies. How do you get the idea of a photon across? Well, we've got some really nice analogies that we've used. We wanted to get the idea that photons are, I start from the idea of particles, not uh, waves. And so uh, what we've used is a, a very popular children's toy called a Nerf gun. A Nerf gun is a... a um, brightly coloured, I'll show you a photo in a moment, um, a brightly coloured machine that sends out foam bullets. And, it, and you can get electric ones that will fire maybe uh, uh, a bullet every second. And so you have a stream of bullets like the photons coming out of a laser. And uh, uh, so we've done many experiments with those. Um, geometry in curved space. You need a practical way to do geometry in curved space. You have to get away from the flat piece of paper. What is a suitable flat piece of paper? A uh, suitable space to use. Well, we have used the Chinese cooking pots called woks. Uh, uh, and uh, I'll show you some photos of that. We've um, we'd used lasers and uh, uh, and have a very beautiful experiment that I'll show you a little video of um, where uh, you uh, use the lasers to look at reflection interference from soap films. Um, works extremely well, also diffraction. 
But then we do a lot of thought experiments. We also make use of lots of YouTube videos and, um, uh, and some things are not easy to do experimentally. For example, single photon interference. You can't do it very easily experimentally, but there is a, a beautiful video available on YouTube that shows single photons uh, interfering and images breaking up. Um, and um, uh, ocean waves from Google Earth, and there are so many resources out there. So here's some experimental curved space geometry. These are little magnets. And here our students are making triangles on the surface of a walk. The, the little magnets from magnetic assembly toys allow you to survey accurate straight lines. You can be sure that they are the shortest ones by using a piece of string. Uh, and then you can measure the, um, the um, circumference of the triangle by measuring the total length of string. And you can measure the angles and find out how the geometry works in this curved space environment. And this is very cheap to do, very, very simple. And students come up with uh, graphs like this that show that the sum of the angles of a triangle, if they're very small, they tend to converge towards 180 degrees. And as the triangles get bigger and bigger and bigger, the uh, sum of the angles gets larger and larger. The idea of space-time. Uh, I haven't really got time to talk about all of it because it, it is something that needs to be developed quite, uh, um, quite carefully. But, uh, but we always make use of, of this uh, um, sign, which says, McDonald's, 25 minutes away. Does that mean if I stand here for 25 minutes, McDonald's will arrive? <laughs> I saw one in Rome, actually. It said, uh, McDonald's uh, uno minuta. <laughs> and, uh, uh, of course, what it says is that something about velocity is connecting space and time. And, uh, and at some velocity, uh, in 25 minutes, you'll get there. Seeing this one is from America, it probably means... 80 miles per hour or some speed like that. But uh, clearly, there is a speed that connects space with time. And, uh, and then, of course, you can say, well, what is the speed that we should connect space with time? And that's, But to proceed all of that, it's important to, uh, to ask, how do we measure space and how do we measure time? and to show people that we measure space by some completely arbitrary units based on some bar of platinum in Paris, and we measure time by some uh, equally arbitrary um, method that probably in history goes back to the pulse of our heart, something that gave us roughly one second. And, um, and then you can say, well, if you're going to have a universal connection, there has to be a velocity to make the connection. And of course, that velocity is the speed of light. Students work that out for themselves. And then they can make space-time diagrams. And we ask students to do space-time diagrams of their journey to school. Um, and that one can take you very well uh, towards understanding um, many uh, things, sophisticated things, such as this one, well, adding, adding this thing that we call Einstein's first law of motion. Einstein's first law of motion is analogous to Newton's first law of motion, but Einstein's law says that all freely falling objects follow the shortest path in space-time, and that's the one that leads to the uh, principle of maximal ageing, that you get old fastest in free fall. Um, I was quite astonished that um, bright 14-year-olds were able to actually, actually calculate the time difference between the top and the bottom of a tower based on those ideas. 
So I would say that wouldn't be quite general at all students, but uh, in a, a, a talented class of students, students were able to calculate the time difference, which is uh, 10 to the minus 16 per metre. It's g over c squared per metre is the time difference as a function of height that comes from general relativity. And that, of course, is the origin of gravity. Um, now, I want to show, I, I did something slightly wrong with this, but uh, this, I want to show you a video that was made by one of my, oops, I've gone wrong. Oh, where am I up to? Was one of my PhD students made the video of something we were doing in a class where we were using, um, uh, when we were using Nerf guns to take photog photographs and also to show the uncertainty principle. Uh, this is not a very professional video. <laughs> So that's all probably a bit confusing to you, but what, what, we were, what we do is have some of these guns shining lots of photons at the person, and the bullets stick to a whiteboard. And so in the end, uh, the person goes away and there's a silhouette photograph left of the, of the student. So our analogy here, is these Nerf gun bullets are photons, and here we have some photographic medium which is, uh, uh, has allowed uh, an image to be, uh, 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 to be seen. But now I want to show one extra little bit, if I can. Um, what's happened? There we are. I just want to play it. I want to show you the uncertainty principle. Here. This is the un now measuring a balloon. <laughs> what we've been learning okay. is called quantum. There. So that was. So there you saw two things, which was photography with Nerf gun photons, and then measuring a balloon with Nerf gun photons. And the balloon, because of its low mass, recoils very badly. And so you ha get the quantum uncertainty principle uh, obviously happening. Uh, you can't tell the precise position. And the more photons you use, the greater the recoil. And uh, so I think they get that idea. Now, the next is teaching them about uh, matter tells space how to curve. Space tells matter how to move. The space we use is this material which we call lycra. In America, they call it spandex. What do you call it in Europe? Lycra. Lycra, OK. So, uh, so this is a standard sheet of lycra. And then we do some. We actually head in a dead straight line, as you can see there. Empty space. Force to follow that curvature, it'll go around that object. That's some. known as an orbit. In this case, it became orbit. These are golf balls. Speed, so eventually, it will succumb to the gravity of fields and be pulled in. It's actually. Here is so the go, Earth the Moon back system. Back and then the swing shot back again. That's it. So it's the bigger race there. So that demonstrates very nicely the idea of. Uh, Space tells matter, matter tells space how to curve, space tells matter how to move. Of course, it's very important to explain this as an analogy. But I, that's a very simple demonstration to set up. It costs, you know, five euros for the piece of lycra, stretch it over a wooden frame, and then collect some golf balls, and uh, uh, it works, um, works very well. Um, and the, 
uh, back to the Nerf gun. Uh, this is just a photo to show the photoelectric effect. In this case, we have ping pong balls inside saucers. And here is the Nerf gun shooting, uh, sh shooting uh, bullets at these electrons, which are confined in potential wells. And you can change the size of the potential well, you can say, change the size of the balls uh, and, uh, uh, and see uh, the balls being released from that system, so il illustrating that idea. Now the last one um, <coughs> is to show interference and, and one of the most important ideas here is to teach people about the distance between photons. And I'm sure that a lot of you will never have thought about this. Um, if you consider looking at a sixth magnitude star, that is the dimmest star you can see with a human eye. Um, the number of photons per second entering your eye is about 300 per second. So with the Nerf guns, we first of all ask the children to say, uh, how far apart are the bullets, the Nerf gun bullets coming out of that gun? Or you estimate the velocity, and, uh, or you can ask a question like, if I have a machine gun firing a bullet at one kilometer per second, and I fire 20 bullets per second, how far apart are those bullets? And people can see easily they are 50 metres apart. So then, I have 300 photons per second coming into my eye. How far apart are those photons? Well, they're travelling 300,000 kilometres per second. So those photons are 1,000 kilometres apart. When one photon enters my eye, the next nearest photon is 1,000 kilometres away. And then say, suppose you just... Uh, screw up your eyes a little bit and look through your eyelashes and see some diffraction taking place. Then you are still looking at the sixth magnitude star. It now has changed its shape a little bit because of the diffraction pattern. But there, when one photon is passing through there, the next photon is a thousand kilometers away. Clearly this is not interference of the photons themselves, because they are so far separated. So uh, then you can say, well, what is an experiment you can do like that? Well, you want to have an experiment where the size of the interference region is very small. And appropriate choice is a film of soap, a soap film. So we make, and this is a, a very simple thing, I told somebody about it at uh, uh, called, told Carlo Bradaccia about this at uh, Virgo la, uh, last week and he said, oh, that sounds really good, can we try and make one? And within five minutes we had found a piece of wire, we'd gone to the kitchen to get some soap, no, we went to the toilet actually to find some soap, we made some soap solution and we did this experiment and I'm going to show this to you just here in this next slide. Um, the most important thing here is that you make a soap film and then you don't look at the light which passes through the film, you look at the light that reflects from the film. And that has got, will show interference between the two paths of light from the front and the back surface of the film, which is about one micron thick. And if my video will work, you can see this as a live video. So that is a draining soap film through a little loop of wire. And you can see all sorts of beautiful physics that goes on inside the soap films. And in a little while the film breaks. But, uh, for, but you, you can see, and if anybody wants to know exactly how to make one of these, I can tell you afterwards, because I have to show you with my hands. So. Uh, so that allows you to, to demonstrate this so quantum world. Um, and uh, yeah, and so you can also say in this situation, 
when you're doing this interference experiment. You have interference between a photon and, an, and if you want to think in terms of another photon, the other photon hasn't yet been created inside the laser because in this very thin film, again, the probability of there being two photons at the same time is rather small, depending on the intensity. So, I think that these are all ideas that everyone can know. They're not ideas that have to be, t that have to be left for the, either the mathematically talented or for the scientific elite. They, these are ideas that should be for everybody. That we live in curved space with rippling geometry, warping time, the world is quantum, quantum reality underpins technology. Matter has wave behavior, and waves have particle behavior. But it's really important that we still stress that the old approximations are still useful. And uh, clearly, if you're a builder building a house, it doesn't really matter if the Earth is round or if the Earth is flat. So, uh, so the flat earth is still useful if you're building a building, but it doesn't mean to say it is right. The truth is important. Um, Euclidean geometry is still useful for architects. Um, wave properties are useful for radio engineers. Um, Galilean relativity is okay for a car crash, but it doesn't mean to say it's the truth, and we need to separate between the truth and the things that the, the useful approximations. So the bottom line is that the modern world depends on Einsteinian physics. And what I like to say to the children is it's all in your mobile phone. Everything in your mobile phone is Einsteinian physics. The GPS navigator is, de is corrected for the time difference between the satellites and the, um, um, and the Earth. Um, and the semiconductor physics depends on electrons wave having wave-like uh, properties. Our experience is that the children say it's fun and it's interesting and they're not too young to understand it. But uh, for the second last slide, uh, what Einstein said is education is what remains after one has forgotten everything one learnt at school. Now, I think that's a very cynical attitude and a, very, a, a sad attitude, but it's also true. <laughs> and we all need to try to fight that and stop that from being true. Um, so we need, to, uh, we need to learn how to teach children the truth. And uh, the last is a referee's comment. And this an anonymous referee, I don't know who the referee was, but he said um, this was a, for a funding application, and he said an approach that directly teaches students our richest, most current and most productive ways of understanding the universe just makes sense. It's certainly also an innovative approach. It's an approach that has, um, a, um, that's not been attempted anywhere in the world to date. The findings have potential to be revolutionary. Well, I'm not sure if it's revolutionary, but uh, I think it's something that we can all try to do. Thanks. So, David, thank you so much for this beautiful seminar. Uh, questions uh, uh, from the audience? Let me be a little bit, uh, let's say, skeptical somehow. I mean, I, 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 I appreciated very much your, your approach. However, what I want to ask you is the following. Basically, teaching basic uh, ge geometry, and Euclid Euclidean geometry and uh, basic science is something which is uh, uh, can, can be relevant for everyday life uh, application. For instance, if you want to know how, how well you can fit your f new furniture in your house, you do not need uh, non uh, I mean, Riemannian geometry. No? You just need... Uh, so, in principle, what, I mean, how would you uh, somehow uh, 
combine the need for the usage of uh, simple mathematics for everyday life uh, with these new ideas which by far are somehow a kind of uh, a little bit more complex. Yeah. Uh, huh? yeah. Well, uh, I would... I agree that it's, it's important that people know that everybody should learn that area of a rectangle equals length times breadth. That's, that's what an engineer needs to know, it's what an architect needs to know, uh, things of that sort. But at the same time, your argument could be used to say we shouldn't teach anybody that the earth is round because, we can, because flat is good enough for building roads and doing all the things we do. But my, my claim is that the truth is important and that people need to know the truth and they need to be learn, know the tools for living. And the tools for living involve Euclidean geometry. Uh, and so I don't deny it's important to learn to Euclidean geometry, but we should never tell the students that that is exact. We need to tell them that there's, that is an approximation, that the reality is this, but you can use this when necessary. We already do it for, the, uh, you know, uh, for we know the earth, earth is spherical, but we don't use spherical geometry when we lay out building lots. So uh, it's just a matter of adding the truth without subtracting the useful methods. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hello. I think this is a very stimulating activity and potentially attracting young people towards science since they are very young. What I wanted to ask you, well, are actually three, three things. Yeah. The first is which was the background of the teachers which were trained by you. Yeah. The second, if you told them that there is actually a tension between quantum mechanics and gravity, yes. in spite of the success. Yeah. And the third is, well, actually a statement. I don't really agree with that statement of yours about the interference between photons coming far away. Okay, but that's another story. Uh -huh. Okay, well... Uh so uh, one relates to interpretation, the last one relates to interpretation of quantum mechanics, uh, and, uh, um, but your, fir your first, what was the? the background of the teacher. Oh yes, so there, um, as, I, as I tried to emphasize, the teachers were to some extent self-selected, but they were different, they're, but they came from different backgrounds. And we found that the um, professional, um, experienced teachers who had been teaching, say, years 11 and 12, the last final years of high school, um, tended to know some of the modern physics. But the younger students, uh, the younger teachers, some of them were primary school teachers. They had had a general training in education where they have, will have had some lectures in science. They knew none of, uh, none of that. Um, so we had, a ra had this range of teachers um, where, where there were primary school teachers with, I'd say, low-level training, Mi uh, uh, middle school teachers who were generally trained in something like sports science, and they were still teaching biology and uh, physics and chemistry. Um, and, uh, and then there were some of the... Uh, uh, the others. I'd say it is not a complete survey of it. They're only the teachers were able to access because it's not so easy to access large numbers of teachers. So your second question? And the third was whether you teach them something oh. about the tension between quantum Oh yes, yeah. And I do think that's really important. I, I think um, the worst thing we can do is to teach students that we know everything and it's all complete. The, what is inspiring for people to go into science is for there to be mysteries. So all of the mysteries of the universe are really important to emphasise. I didn't emphasise it in, that, um, in, my, in my talk. But um, that, is, that is really, um, really important, that we need, to, we need to, uh, students to realise that we, we don't know everything about the universe by any means. And also the fact that the interpretation of quantum mechanics is something that we can't understand. I, 
I am actually slightly worried that some of the students might be put off by the difficulty to understand quantum mechanics. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't teach it to them. <laughs> Yeah. I, um, first question, uh, the, the youngest people in your videos uh, was about 11 years old probably. Yeah. Uh, uh, did you try with the younger, uh, I don't know, six, seven, eight years old? Uh, because uh, there is a, some age in which the magic part, the monster, mm. the cartoons uh, mm. uh, had to translate in some yeah. more uh, scientific. So, which is your experience with the younger people? No, well, um, my, experience, my experience is really only with probably 11. I've done the things with other classes, but not, um, not trying to teach these things. There is another group in Australia that is trying to teach atomic physics to younger children. And... Uh, um, and it seems to me a perfectly appropriate thing to, to be doing, but we, we just haven't focused on that. It, 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 what has happened is we've generally had a, a PhD student who's chosen a certain range of children to work with. We've had one that's working with um, what we call year nine. This means just counting the number of years since they started school. So year nine, year 10, Year six, year seven, those are the years we've worked with. And the second question, you mentioned that uh, uh, you did this, uh, this experiment, this lesson with uh, um, a, selected, uh, uh, a selection of uh, very uh, good students. Did you try also oh. on uh, oh, normal no. or normal classes? So oh. the, no, the, the, uh, most of what we've done has been with quite normal classes. Okay. Only with the 16-year-olds did we do it with okay. selected very bright so ones? It, it works uh, in, with normal... Uh, yeah, it does. And, and we've done it with one group that is even... Uh, it is probably a culture... Uh, well, a, um, a school from a deprived Zone. area of Perth. And it, that seems to have worked quite well there. We've used slightly different techniques. Another technique we've been using, which I didn't mention at all, is drama. And we have two beautiful little plays, one about quantum mechanics and one about, uh, um, about gravity. And uh, I think they work really well with the kids as well. And, and where children, there's a place for all the... Uh, um, everybody in the class to have a role in, uh, in a play and somebody will be playing Newton, somebody will be playing Einstein, uh, many different characters were, uh, from history uh, come together to argue the truth. Hi David, hmm. did you make any long-term impact of your program on the student? No, we haven't been doing it for long enough to, uh, we are hoping that this year we will be measuring the effects of our program on students that we tested last year. And those were 14-year-old um, students, and we'll be testing them when they're 15. But long, real long-term uh, effects, we don't know. We haven't been doing it for long enough. And it can be difficult. And David, how many students could you test? Uh, <laughs> uh, um, we did it uh, with uh, six classes um, at, one, at one school. Um, we had six classes in parallel, and uh, the PhD student was working a whole week over a period of about 10 weeks with the, the students. And uh, another PhD student has been, uh, di did a total of about 20 classes um, for one class, I think it was, so about 30 students. I can't remember if it was two, one or two classes. Did Jody do one or two classes? Maybe 30 or 60 students, and then others have been about, again, about 30 to 60 students. So that's the typical class size. I've 
a comment more than a question. So the, the main message I got from your presentation is probably that the, the right approach in teaching science is to say that um, science is not an exact uh, uh, picture of, of reality, but it is an approach. And so you use uh, uh, the best approach depending on, on the scale you are, uh, you are studying. So if you are dealing with uh, car crashes, you use uh, Newtonian and Galilean uh, relativity or uh, equation. When you deal with the stars and the particles, you have to include relativity. So this is the message, uh, the right message to give to children or not? Well, I, I would say, what I would say is that we are trying to, to be, have the foundation to be our best understanding of the universe. We, we have to make it clear that we don't have a perfect understanding, but we at least give the best understanding. We do want people to learn that there has been, uh, that our understanding has been getting better and better over the centuries. And, uh, uh, but I, I think I would argue very strongly that the understanding we have today is much better than the understanding we had 100 years ago, which is better than the understanding we had 200 years ago. It is, it is a process of progress. So we want to be starting by uh, introducing ideas from the very top of our understanding of the truth, but then reminding students, reminding everybody, that we have approximations that we always make in our lives and, and need to be able to make those approximations to be able to do simple things. Yeah, also because it's not worth to, to use uh, uh, relativistic correction when you are dealing with car crashes because yes. they don't have nothing. So I think yeah. this is also an important message you have to pass to, to, to the children. So that yeah. you, you uh, how to say, you introduce something more uh, precise mm. when you need it. Yeah, mm. but uh, that con contrasts with the way that we teach at the moment where we, uh, where we say that we, we make the students, we've, we've picked a point in time which is probably about 1850 and we say, we teach you everything that we knew about the universe up to 1850 and then at a later stage in your career you can learn some new things. And that, I think, is the big mistake that we well, are making. This, uh, yeah. I agree completely yeah. that some yeah. fundamental concept of modern science, let's say, uh, should be given at the very, very beginning of your uh, mm. uh, training mm. so that you are not, how to say, worried when you are introduced to them. But probably it's also important to remark that for everyday life uh, you can survive also without knowing the details of uh, quantum gravity and relativity yeah, or yeah. things like this. Thank you. Yeah, 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 I agree. Uh, good evening. Um, I'm talking um, for a teacher who is not here because of uh, the age, uh, but this teacher for 20 years uh, um, tried in his classes from uh, uh, the first one in uh, secondary school to the fifth one, uh, this approach very similar to yours. Uh, really? Yes, in north of Italy. And um, I know him by email because I've been uh, yeah. <laughs> chatting with him about this mm. approach, uh, which are which is really interesting to me. Um, I find it... Um, well, I want, to, I want you to say that because uh, there is an example. <laughs> there is a person who did that for 20 years uh, successfully so, oh. in Italy. So it can work. <laughs> huh. uh, I just mm. wanted to tell you. Yeah. And, uh, mm, yes, and, for example... Um, the could I just ask uh, if, uh, if anything was, has been written or published about sure, that? Sure, uh, yes, I know uh, there is a, a, a website of this uh, gentleman. Oh. Mm. Um, the name is uh, Rodolfo Damiani, and um, he has, of course, all the um, syllabus and courses and he developed. Mm. And uh, as far as I understood, uh, uh, the first year is all about uh, what you said, mm. just to introduce this new way of uh, knowing the reality, mm. and then building up 
uh, in, the last, in the next four years, uh, or the rest. <laughs> mm. Um, mm. I don't know the details yet, yeah. but uh, of course contacting him would be, he would be very happy to, to, to share, mm. of course. Mm. He's retired now. I, I think he retired a few years ago. But, uh, and he did it in the secondary school where, with a scientific, uh, mm, a specific scientific curriculum mm. um, from Italy, PNA, P, PNA you know, mm. the, and um, so it is possible. Yes. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for your <laughs> conference. Uh, I could, uh, should just say that we, we've been doing a survey of uh, the curricula in different countries uh, to try to find out, you know, what, and, and they're generally fairly similar. One of the countries that has got the most uh, developed curriculum in that area is Nigeria, surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> but also some experiments were done in Lebanon in the 1980s uh, with um, this type of teaching, but, but there's rather little about it. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen uh, some little videos that you can get on YouTube that are called Minute Physics. Uh, there's a very nice one which has basically all of the, what I was trying to say, all in two minutes, um, and it's called Dear President Obama. I don't know if anyone has seen it, but in this, if you look up in YouTube, Dear President Obama, you see this beautiful little video that is saying why they should modernise the uh, physics education curriculum. Excuse me, it works. Um, there is something I don't agree with your uh, uh, speech, not the approach, the speech. The reference to truth, yeah. I don't think truth, uh, uh, general speaking, and in particular uh, about uh, teaching. I'm, I'm, very, I'm very close to the, some of the, the, of the question and uh, of, of the colleagues that uh, preceded me uh, before. And mm, what I want to say is that you can provoke some new thinking in students uh, starting from ordinary things they live today with new technologies and pro problems, you can uh, insert some of these ideas in the traditional curriculum. curriculum. You can provoke them, you can uh, present to them uh, different and new things, uh, but I don't think that uh, you have to modify in a very structural sense what we do at school. Because it's so revolutionary, uh, I think in a didactic sense, uh, inertial, the, the first law of uh, uh, mechanics, the, the, the ideas of Galileo are so revolutionary for them in uh, modifying their brain, their mind, uh, and you can continue starting from, the, from there uh, to provoke them and present to them different approaches, different uh, problems, different uh, way to observe reality and the world around them. I, I don't know if I was clear in my speech, but I tried to, uh, not to present any, any truth. We, we don't have truth, we try to understand what is around us. Well, I, I, would, uh, I, would, I would say that, there is no, that we don't have any absolute truth, but we have the best approximation to the truth. It's a better approximation to the truth that the Earth is a sphere than it is that the Earth is flat, for example. So. Uh, uh, but yeah, you mentioned Galileo. What, what I always have found very interesting is that, uh, that we should think so intuitively today in terms of Galilean relativity. Because, 
before Galileo, that was quite a revolutionary idea. Um, it, it's always, I always found it really astonishing that people should have believed Aristotle's views of free fall when you only had to take two, small, two objects and drop them on your feet and to see that the heavy one doesn't get there first before the light one, even though that was clearly espoused by Galileo, uh, by Aristotle. So there are truths that are, that we can, there are things that we can say are definitely untrue, and I think we can say that definitely the nature of space around us is space which is curved and not space which is uh, which is flat. And in particular, gravity is explained completely naturally in terms of the ideas of the warping of time, but is not simply explained by Newtonian physics. Newt in Newtonian physics, it is, it is, gravity is simply some mysterious force that comes out of objects. And you find many, many cases where people and teachers will say that gravity is a mysterious force and nobody understands it. And that is, does not re represent the state of the, our general understanding of the universe. So um, I don't quite agree with you, but I, but, I do, but I don't want you to think that I'm saying that we have the absolute truth. I'm not saying that. The Catholic Church may say that, but... Uh, I'm looking for, but I'm saying that it is the best approximation to the truth. Depends on the problem we have, the best approximation. Huh. Okay, I, there is one more question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you if you've considered that uh, some teachers are not, uh, well, I could say not so young, so they uh, they have not lived a period of the time where um, they could study a particular matter, for example, the modern physics. Mm. So could be uh, this fact uh, the cause of the problem you mentioned. Um, well. I think that what we are doing is bringing it, bringing the ideas to a level that are sufficiently simple by using the analogies that we are using uh, and using the, the sort of resources that I showed in the videos. Uh, it doesn't become particularly challenging for a teacher, an older teacher who has been trained in other ways, except for the fact that they do need to change their curriculum material, but I think it's, uh, and from our testing of teachers, there have been quite senior teachers amongst the ones we've tested, they do seem to be able to accommodate the ideas quite easily. Mm -hmm. So uh, we don't know enough to be able to say def anything definitive, but I believe it's quite possible. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Okay. Uh, there's some coffee outside, so if there's no question, comments, we can go on outside. And let's thank again a <laughs> lot the speaker. Thanks so much, David.